um, obviously a hugely topical um, subject at the moment. Can't turn on the TV without without seeing some news on this, um, and so I'm excited that we can we can bring an African context to um, to probably the most topical subject of the day. Uh, my name is Charles Douglas. I am the co-head of m a at Bowman's, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome. Um, our distinguished panel. We have a really wonderful panel um, today. Uh, firstly, let me introduce John Stremlaw. Uh, John is a gentleman wearing a tie. Uh, he is an honorary professor of international relations at the University of Witwatersrand, uh, where he founded the Center for Africa's International Relations. During his career, he served as Vice President for Peace Programs at the, at the Carter Center, Senior Advisor to the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, Deputy Director for Policy Planning in the Office of the US Secretary of State during the administration of President George Bush Senior, Strategic Planning Officer for the World Bank and an Officer of the Rockefeller Foundation. It is quite a resume. John, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, then uh, Herman Warren uh, is, uh, is a gentleman wearing the, the uh, earphones. He is uh, the Corporate Network Networks Director for Africa. He provides insight and analysis on a, a range of, of African related topics and regularly chairs and moderates events and delivers customer briefings, custom briefings to, to senior executives. He's also the author of white papers on infrastructure, as well as financial and commercial developments in this region. Uh, Herman previously worked with Bain and Company. He's uh, started and run a mobile technology company and has also held uh, various senior posts in public and private sector corporations. So welcome Herman, thank you for being with us. And last but not least Great. is, is uh, thanks, is, is Millard Arnold, who is a senior consultant to, to Bowman's corporate practice. Um, before that, he served as the first minister counselor to Africa for commercial affairs for, for the US Department of Commerce. And he, he may tell you what that, what that really entails during the course of today. Um, Millard served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs during the Carter administration. And he's also served in South Africa as the honorary business representative for the government of, of Singapore. Uh, Millard began his, his career with, with Sherman and Sterling in New York as a lawyer. So welcome Millard, G great to have you as well. Thank you, George. Um, so we're gonna break our discussion into three parts. Um, the first part is essentially to set the scene. Uh, we'll discuss the elections in general, how they work, uh, possible permutations in respective outcomes, and some of the possible issues associated with the elections. Um, we'll then turn secondly to discuss some global trends that, that could be impacted by the outcome of the elections and their particular or potential relevance to Africa. And then lastly, um, we're going to turn to some Africa specifics. Um, then in terms of approach, um, I've agreed with the panel uh, that this conversation is a richer one. If the panelists feel free to express their own personal views on, on the matters, recognizing that in some circumstances, those views may be influenced by their own politics. Um, but at the same time, we're also going to try and, and give a balanced view or alternative views on, on the matters that we talk about today. So that's, that's in terms of our approach. Um, if you have any questions, uh, in, in the normal way, you'll see that there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, you're welcome to post your questions there. We will treat them as anonymous, so we're not going to mention um, who has posed each of the questions. Um, and our plan is um, to make some time for questions uh, towards the end of the webinar, but we'll, we're just going to see how that goes and, and how the discussion flows. But, but we should have time for questions at the end. Um, we've got 90 minutes set aside for this, web this webinar. So to dive um, right into it, um, and Millard, if I can start with you, 
Um, can you just uh, give a sense of, of because we, we hear all this um, information, but, but bringing it back to basics, how does this voting work? Um, and in broad parameters, what are the possible permutations in respect of who is elected as president and, and control of the Senate. Well, thank you, uh, Charles. It's, uh, as everyone I think is aware, a very complex subject, and I'll try and do my best with that. Um, presidential elections in the US are a two-step process. In step one on election day, the residents of each state indicates their preference for president. And by so doing, they in essence select electors reflecting that preference, who in step two actually cast the formal vote for the presidency. In most instances, the elector is not compelled to cast his or her vote in favor of the preference of the electorate, even if the electorate overwhelmingly chooses its preferred candidate. The people do not elect the president, the electors do. There is no national popular vote and no tabulation of the national popular vote is ever made. So who are the electors and why is this process necessary? The bedrock of American democracy is states. The people express their desires and political ambitions through their state. That's why it's the United States of America. The selection of the president therefore is done by each state. The people in each state indicate their preference on election day, which is every four years and always the first Tuesday in November. Each state is accorded a number of electors depending on its population. Every state, regardless of size, has two senators, and a number of representatives proportionate to the number of citizens in their state in relation to the national population. This is the so-called electoral college. Based on the formula as to how electoral votes are allocated, the sum total of electoral votes in the college is 538. To win the presidency, a candidate must secure half of the votes of the Electoral College or 270 electoral votes. The candidate who, quote, wins the vote in each state is allocated all of that state's electoral votes, even if he or she only manages to defeat their rival by one vote. It is a winner take all system or first past the post. Each state tallies up the preferences indicated by its citizens and ideally allocates its electoral votes to the winning candidate. According to the constitution on the Monday after the second Wednesday in December, the electors of all of the states meet to determine who won the presidency. This year, that date is 14 December. The electors then forward their decision to the new Congress, who on 6 January formally declares the winner of the 2020 election. The role of the Electoral College then is to cast, certify, and transmit the votes of the states. If there is a tie, then the House of Representatives selects the president based on one vote for each state with a simple majority deciding. Thus, there are 50 states, 26 states vote in favor of one of the candidates, that would be the winner. The effects of the electoral system in the United States is that a minority determines who will be president. Despite platitudes about democracy and majority rule, America has almost always been subjected to the tyranny of the minority. Whether it was when voting was limited to only white males 21 years of age with property or to the electoral college I just described or to the discrimination in favor of small states against larger ones or the exclusion of half of the population because women couldn't vote or to the, to the uh, denial and suppression of black voters 
to, to Gore winning the popular vote but losing the election in, in 2000, or Hillary winning the popular vote but losing the election in 2016. America has been dominated by the tyranny of the minority. And Trump, who lost the popular vote by nearly 3 million votes, can in effect tie America to a, to a minority judicial perspective for the next 40 years by the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, the tyranny of the minority. Why was this cumbersome process established? The founders had no intention of creating a pure majority rule democracy. In short, the framers of the constitution did not trust the American people. And sadly, that reality still exists. Thanks, Milad. Um, there's a lot of process in there, and, and obviously you've emphasized um, the tyranny of the minority. John, if I can sort of come to you next, within the context of some of the process and, and procedure that Milad has, has outlined, do you expect these elections to be free and fair um, and, and accepted regardless of outcome? And, and I suppose the question within the context of that is, is what is the state of democracy in the US in, in your view? Well, thanks Charles and, and greetings everybody. Um, Millard has uh, outlined the, the problems very clearly. Uh, when you say free and fair, Charles, it reminds me that my work at the Carter Center, which included leading electoral observation missions to some 20 African countries during the period that I was there, we all often use the term credible rather than free and fair because no election ever is flawless and incumbents particularly, and everyone will know this, fear losing. And so to the extent that they can get away with, uh, with, with, with influence beyond the normal processes, they will do so. Um, the US system is badly flawed but it has persisted for 230 years. What concerns me right now is that the recent poll by YouGov and Yahoo shows that 22% of the voters only think this election will be, in your terms, free and fair. And yet, and yet there have been already 50 million voters who have risked the pandemic and for the most part, some have mailed their ballots in, but many, the majority have gone in person to vote early to be sure their vote was registered. Um, it, it helps to remind ourselves that de democratic experiments depend fundamentally on the consent of the losers. And I think Trump's unprecedented and dangerous denigration of the electoral process as a president in office uh, has maybe fueled that, that polling data that, that uh, YouGov has, uh, and I have indicated. Trump won in 2016, as Millard said, uh, in the electoral college, not in the popular majority. Uh, for those in South Africa who believe in one person, one vote, this is a obvious democratic deficit. It was close to getting a bipartisan agreement to overthrow the electoral college 50 years ago, but a filibuster by a few Southern segregationists sent it off the rails. And now the new Republican minority sees this um, flaw as its only route to continued power as Millard indicated. So that, means that Biden must win by at least 4% uh, on the popular vote to overcome his deficit in the Electoral College. The current polling has him by composites uh, up at least 8%. That was the Washington Post today. But the composites that um, are done by 538, and I urge people if they're interested in following this to go to that 538.com website, because uh, that team puts together all the composite votes and it would suggest that uh, Biden currently has an 87% chance of winning uh, Trump 12% and the deadlock that would be a 
a tie vote and settled in the House of Representatives is only 1%. So I am counting on a Biden win, but it must be decisive and it must be able to convince all that Trump has lost. Um, maybe I should uh, end my initial remarks there and defer back to you, Charles. Okay, thanks. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll come back to some of those themes. Thanks, John. Um, I just wanna pick up on one thing, uh, coming back to you again, Milad. Um, uh, I think we, we, you spoke about the tie vote and the House of, the, in the House. I think we can perhaps leave that to one side. The, 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 the other part, which is sort of quite striking in what John says is, is the, the sense of the consent of, of the losers um, and a possible legal challenge to the Supreme Court. Um, can you just give us a, a kind of brief sense of how that might look, um, how that process might work and, 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 and how long it could take? Uh, I'll do my best, Charles. It too is complicated. Um, and let's start with something that John alluded to. Um, and that is, we know from listening to the various broadcasts on television stations and radio and uh, all, over the, all over social media, that at least Trump has made it clear that um, he has not decided whether he would step down if the elections were to indicate that he lost. And there is a fear um, circulating that as a consequence of many of the in-person ballots and the early received mail-in ballots, that the process on election night, especially in states that allow pre-processing of these ballots, states such as um, um, uh, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, many of those states will be able to report out on the night who has won their respective uh, uh, votes. The fear is that somewhere around 10 or 11 o'clock on the night of November 3rd, election night, President Trump will indicate uh, in a public broadcast one way or the other that he has won the election. And what that does in effect is to put a marker down and he would then say, the only reason I lose this election is because of fraud um, and fraud in the mail-in ballots that have come in or fraud in some other part of the process. Now, how does this play out? Well, according to the constitution, there is 35 days after the election. So from the election on November 3rd until the 8th of December, um, the states have the, any disputes must be raised and settled uh, as much as possible between the 3rd of November and the 8th of December so that the, the, the uh, electoral college can meet on the 14th and make a selection. Now, if they make a selection and it goes to the Senate on January 6th, the Senate, uh, the president of the Senate opens and reads all of the electoral votes as specified in Article Two of the Twelfth and the Twelfth Amendment of the Constitution, and then here comes the kicker: the President of the Senate shall call for objections, if any. If a single member of each House of Congress, just one from the House and one from the Senate, objects to the results, then both House then both Houses of Congress shall go back to their respective chambers and decide how to resolve the conflict. This. Uh, this could well either mean going back to their states or it could mean going to the uh, Supreme Court. In going to the Supreme Court, it has to be an issue of, of constitutional merit. And my argument, I think, would be that Trump will argue that the fraud that has taken place, presumed fraud that has taken place, has denied him equal protection under law and that would be the basis for being able to raise this matter in the Supreme Court. Uh, Amy, Conant, uh, Amy Conant Barrett is supposed to be nominated, uh, as, as the vote on her nomination is today. If she should uh, win that, and she should, it will mean that the will be nine uh, justices, six of whom have a, 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 
a minor, a, a conservative leaning, and more likely than not, could well re, uh, in the re, uh, sorry could well choose uh, to decide in favor of Trump as the president of the United States. It's uh, there are some other steps in this, but I think I'll stop there. Okay. Um, thanks. I mean, it, it sounds like, um, and I guess we've we've seen some markers for some potential disputes. Um, and certainly there've been some, some indicators that that could be um, where we end up. Um, Herman, coming to you, in the context of um, disputes of this nature um, uh, within the US, um, what's your sense? Because after this, we wanna move firstly to some global trends that may impact Africa and then some Africa specifics. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we are stuck in, in a sort of battle regarding where the leadership ends up. Do you, do, you, do you think America has time for the rest of the world within that, within that context? Or does it become rather all consuming? Sure, Charles, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks very much for your question. And again, for, uh, for giving me space to participate in, in today's, today's session. Uh, let me just start by saying, and perhaps it goes without saying that the environment we find ourselves in uh, is incredibly polarized. So if you listen to the Democrats, they're saying, you know, vote like your life depends on it. Uh, and, for, and for many people, regardless of what aisle they find themselves um, on, on, the, on, on, the, on the political divide, um, that, that resonates. Republicans are indicating uh, that the Democrats are seeking to turn the country into some, some form of socialist uh, utopia. Uh, and that if Biden wins, he'll usher in Venezuela-like outcomes. You add to this mix millions of unemployed, many recently in that queue uh, as the result of uh, the, the pandemic, uh, fraying race relations and social discord. So it's an incredibly toxic mix. And to give you the flip side of a stat that uh, Professor Strumlaw uh, mentioned, uh, according to a recent poll uh, by Pew, around three quarters of Americans view this election as a battle for the soul of the nation. So in existential uh, terms. And before I get to the core of your question, let me just touch on um, an aspect uh, of, of some of the permutations that could take place. Um, that were covered in part um, by, by Millard. Um, this is a system which has rewarded the minority. Um, some, some votes are worth more than others. You know, every state gets two electoral college votes for the number of senators they have in the Senate, um, and then votes align to the number of representatives they have in the House of, of Representatives. But the election will turn not on the popular vote, as Millard um, indicated, uh, but on who scores that majority in the Electoral College. And that kind of winning margin usually comes down to key battleground states, states like Pennsylvania, states like Michigan, states like Wisconsin. And there's another wrinkle, if you will, in the equation, because in a number of those battleground states, including the ones that I just mentioned, but not exclusively, you have split control, if you will, of government in that state. So you may have a Republican legislature and a Democratic governor. Think of Michigan. Think of Pennsylvania. And there has to be agreement, if you will, between those two branches on how the electoral college votes will be allocated and placed before the Congress. Um, and that's not guaranteed. And how that dispute will potentially be managed, uh, I'm sure there are others um, uh, who, who are on the panel who might, who might have a perspective about it. In terms of whether the United States will have time for the rest of the world, I think what you will see if it's a continuation of the Trump administration is very much a follow on to the transactional approach that's been adopted on, on foreign relations, foreign relations and many other, other spheres. Uh, I'd argue um, that Trump's uh, administration has been deeply unsettling to traditional allies and has marked a retreat of American leadership in many spheres. You can think about the Paris Climate Accords, you can think about the United States withdrawing from the JCPOA, 
which is meant to contain uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions and so on. Uh, a Biden presidency, I think, will differ fundamentally. Uh, he'll reach out to and seek to reassure allies in a way that Trump hasn't uh, heretofore. Uh, Biden is very much uh, a person who believes in institutions. He embraces multi multilateralism uh, in a way that Trump uh, has not demonstrated to date. Having said all of that, and going back to uh, part of my opening remarks, the country is facing three large crises, a health crisis, an economic crisis, and significant social uh, discord. So while these uh, uh, can't be solved necessarily in a domestic uh, vacuum, much of the focus of, um, if you believe the polls, uh, uh, based on uh, what, um, what Professor Strumlaw uh, eloquently articulated, Biden is likely to win, but much of the focus of the Biden administration undoubtedly will be domestically applied. Okay, good. Thanks, Herman, um, for, for those, those remarks. Um, I think what we wanna do is, is start unpacking a little bit some of what you started talking about in the sense of um, the, the sort of external, the external view to, to the extent that there, there's, is, it's time to focus on things that are external. Um, uh, but before we before we start differentiating, John, I'd like to come to you again um, to get a sense of of what you think um, stays the same no matter who wins. I mean, are, are there certain are there are there certain um, uh, policies or, or um, aspects that you think of are, are in a sense um, unaffected uh, regardless of, of the outcome? Thanks, Charles. Let me just hit three, three points briefly, uh, and I, at the risk of anticipating our, where our discussion is going. Um, the first point is that the Africa pro programs uh, that have been underway for years enjoy bipartisan congressional support. And when Trump's first Assistant Secretary for Africa, Tibor Naj, was confirmed by the Senate, his congressional testimony included a list of programs that any of his Democratic or Republican predecessors could support. PEPFAR for HIV AIDS, Food for Peace, Educational Exchanges, Power Africa, Military Assistance, for Counter Terror, a little bit more militant under Trump, but still uh, had been uh, undertaken by Obama with those lily pad sort of quasi bases. Even Yali, the young leaders for Africa that Obama pioneered was in the agenda. Uh, OGOA, which, which gives uh, Africans preferential access to, the access, access to the United States. If Trump was reelected, he might discover it and want to close it down because it's not by, by trinational and uh, transactional the way he thinks of his, his nationalism. Um, but Biden, even Biden would probably want to make it more reciprocal trade. So um, I think that there is a lot there and I think that um, that will continue. And I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by the Trump administration's uh, willingness to put the, which the Congress approved, of course, the bipartisan, proposed and, and, and approved, the bipartisan build act, which would give um, uh, underwriting for, uh, they project as much as $75 billion by 2025 uh, of investment into Africa. The Development Finance Corporation is promising uh, only on October 16th did Adam Buhler, the, the director of that, the CEO of that, briefed the Atlantic Council on it, and your members can go to the Atlantic Council's website and pick up the discussion of the um, uh, de Development Finance Corporation's efforts in this regard, uh, it, but it's, it, it's highly promising. More briefly and more fundamentally, the second point, um, what will stay the same is the U.S. Constitution. Uh, including the Electoral College and the Senate's disproportionate power rooted in the states that Millard and, and, and Herman and I have talked about already. Um, it, it, the, the U.S. is not about to quickly become more like South Africa, united uh, in its diversity and a home for all who live there. Uh, on the other hand, my third point is there is no subpopulation in the United States that is more American and more democratic with a small d and African Americans, the descendants of slaves, and they will continue this struggle. I am absolutely sure of that. 
And in fact, we're the ones that turned around Joe Biden's candidacy in the South Carolina primary and for which Joe Biden owes a great debt. So I am confident about the enduring ties with Africa at a very fundamental level. And I am heartened by the increased immigration of talented Africans to the United States. And I just hope that there will be an increasingly two-way flow going forward. And I see that as a continuing, no matter how bad this election plays out and the scenarios that we can conjure up are pretty frightening. But I think this role that African-Americans have played to keep the majority honest will continue. Thanks, John. Um, so sort of building on what you said there, and, and, and you, one of the things you mentioned there is the sort of enduring ties with Africa at, at a fundamental level. Um, Milad, coming to you, um, to the extent that's the case, um, uh, can you give a sense, I suppose, in broad terms, before we dig down into the details, why are these elections relevant and, and important for us in Africa, in your view? Uh, thanks, Charles. Um, I think, <clears throat> sorry, I think America has always held itself out as a, a champion of the notion of democracy and the importance of human rights, civil rights, and the role that governments and society should play in the furtherance of the kind of society that's important to people everywhere. The fact that it often falls short of that ideal is um, a part of the American problem. But the reality is <clears throat> that for Africa, it's important that across the board, the notion of democracy in the, the broader sense of the term be explicitly understood and carried out as much as possible. And to the extent that an election in the United States, despite all of the difficulties that are um, that are harboring uh, behind uh, the doors, you know, I think, uh, of this election that's about to take place. And we probably should just touch on that because one small thought that I have in a concern of great, uh, a great concern is not only is, the, is it that Trump will not leave uh, the office as he, as he has indicated, but that uh, we could well lead to massive civil unrest depending on how this election turns out, whether it's a Democratic win by Joe Biden or a Republican win by Donald Trump. I think we may well see a period of uh, sustained unrest in the United States, which has enormous implications, um, not just for the United States, but perhaps even globally as well. But I think in, in the main, both uh, John and Herman have indicated why it's important, uh, these elections are important to Africa. Um, when you look at the, the significant role of African-Americans uh, and the, in the ever growing interest in being relevant to Africa, um, one of the first, I think, uh, likelihoods of a new Biden administration um, will be to place a greater emphasis on Africa than has uh, than has done as in has has been done by Trump. Sorry about that. I got something in my throat. Maybe I should just stop there and, and <clears throat> uh, let you go from there, John. <clears throat> Sorry. No problem. Okay. Uh, let me let me go to John, and then if you want to add Milad after that, then we can we can come back to you. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, building a bit on, on what Millard has, has said, um, I, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about some global trends that, that might impact Africa, which I think is the, the direction of, of travel. Um, John, I'm going to start with you on sort of policy stuff, and then Herman come to you more on economics. Um, but John, if you can just give us a sense on some of the key policy differentials be between Trump and Biden. Um, that could be relevant to Africa. So I'm sort of thinking here, um, approach to China, Russia, climate change, um, democracy and human rights as, as sort of global, as sort of global um, uh, <coughs> priorities. Charles, um, Herman has anticipated this in, in, in his remarks. Biden is a multilateralist unlike Trump, 
That's very important for Africa on a number of fronts, including in foreign trade. But to start at the back end of your question, uh, Charles, the broad global issues, pandemics, climate change, democracy and human rights, highlights the differences between the two candidates in ways that I think Africans particularly will appreciate and take to heart as important. Um, Trump treats the pandemic with magical thinking, the first uh, as a scientific exaggeration and, and an idea how to deal with it with no ideas how to deal with it, warned about the seriousness uh, of it, he ignored it and, and, uh, and exercised incompetence in handling it. He is a climate denialist, although there was some ambiguity in his answer on this at the last debate last week. Um, he favors hydrocarbons to continue uh, as industrial employment bedrock. His base among non-college educated white men in the Rust Belt states remains enthusiastic, even as the coal industry, uh, for its own economic reasons, pursues other renewable and energy saving um, uh, strategies to the extent to which they still have employment. Biden's plans for the pandemic and, and uh, in the absence of cheap and universally vac available vaccines is basically to follow sound public health advice as we do or try to do here. Uh, he would rebuild the CDC to rejoin and rejoin the WHO, which would uh, build and build prevention and early response capabilities within the US government, all of which are of interest, I think, to African nations. His uh, economic recovery plan uh, is worth reading. It's, it's um, build back uh, better uh, under the, that handle. Uh, it includes massive spending, $2 trillion, focusing on rebuilding US infrastructure, but to do it with attentiveness to climate change, the so-called Green New Deal would internalize and externalize climate policy that would include rejoining the Paris Accord refunding uh, the Green Climate Fund, which is important for Africa. Uh, on democracy and human rights, uh, which is not featured at all in the, in the Trump policies, uh, Biden is, is, is planning documents, would re revive uh, the core uh, domestic and foreign policy concerns that the Americans have avowed, but it's very, very complicated. At the moment, there's much talk among his African Biden's African advisors on greater cooperation with democracies. But as you know, from the trend lines of Freedom House and The Economist and Afrobarometer, among many others, uh, this pandemic has, uh, has embedded illiberalism, even as it's proved the hollowness of demagogic promises like Trump's or, or Bolsonaro in Brazil. On US-China relations, quickly, uh, Charles, um, Biden would be a bellwether of how he balances competing interests um, of, of uh, democracy and human rights with regard to Hong Kong or the Muslim minority that is being severely repressed in China. But at the same time, uh, I think he'd be more nuanced in his approach to China and it might be uh, possibilities for uh, co cooperation in climate change and indeed cooperation with regard to the North Korea problem. And, and most importantly for us, uh, I think his approach to China's involvement in Africa would be more nuanced and more responsive to African concerns about how the two countries would relate. I don't have much to add on Russia because Russia has got its own domestic problems, which are very severe and problems with the near abroad, the, the former Soviet republics. Uh, I think he'd be very tough on Putin, much tougher than, than Donald Trump has been because we don't really know the financial dealings between Trump and the Russian oligarchs that maybe will come to light if the judicial process continues in the uh, federal courts in New York. Um, Putin has done well with, with Trump, but uh, I think he'll be preoccupied with his own concerns. And just this morning, he dismissed as a pure fiction the Republican rumors about Hunter Biden's involvement with <laughs> Russia and with Ukraine. So there you are, Charles. There's, there's a lot in there. Um, Herman, before I come to you on economics, Millard, let me just check if is there anything you want to want to add in respect of, of what John has said there. You're on, you're on mute, Millard, sorry. Yeah, 
No, I think John has done a masterful job with that. Charles, there's not much more I can add that would uh, differentiate from what he's already said. Okay. Um, so yeah, Herman, as far as the, the economic plan or, or lack thereof, um, you know, when you, when you compare the, the two candidates, how, how do you decipher that in the sense of, um, you know, John talked about Biden's economic plan, um, build back better, um, versus where, where, where Trump is at and the Republicans. Sure, thanks, thanks Charles. Before I, I, I get into there, I think it, it's very clear that there is a uh, stark difference between the candidates, uh, but I think it's also important to uh, identify any areas of overlap. And one of them is US-China relations. It is probably, it's actually the only um, that, that comes to mind at the moment, area where across the aisle there's agreement that China is a strategic competitor and must be, uh, for lack of a better word, confronted. I think as, uh, as John uh, uh, articulated uh, very compellingly, the approach to which I think Biden would approach that would differ fundamentally than, than the way that we've seen um, Trump attack it. Um, uh, kind of uh, upsetting uh, friends, friends who could possibly uh, also be on the same page with, with wanting to contain uh, China's, China's ambitions. I think uh, Biden would adopt a much more uh, multilateral approach uh, in doing so. Specifically with regard to um, the plans, I think it's, it's very much in line with the Republican plan, uh, the approach that uh, Trump has taken over the last number of years. Um, for example, healthcare. Um, on, the pan on the campaign trail, uh, when he eventually won, um, you know, the, the rallying call was you know, overturning and replacing Obamacare. And there was always a plan just around the corner, you know, days away. Yet there hasn't been a tangible or any form of workable plan uh, put, put on the table. Uh, having said that, as, uh, as John indicated, um, there are some clear areas of bias that we see in Trump's economic approach. Uh, it biases towards the hydrocarbon sector, uh, supporting things like the expansion of, of drilling for oil, uh, shale gas, propping up um, a, a dying coal sector, uh, reducing or eliminating uh, regulations uh, that protect, protect the, the environment. Um, Biden has been uh, much clearer, much, much more precise in putting a, a plan on the table and, and pricing it, so to speak. Um, as indicated, it, it focuses on infrastructure, on, on the social safety net, on education. Uh, the Biden, Biden is proposing $7 trillion um, in, in investment and spend over a decade uh, and indicating that that uh, level of investment would be uh, funded, if you will, uh, through a number of means, uh, one of them raising taxes on both uh, corporates as well as uh, households earning around 5 million rand a year, which is plus minus $400,000 a year. It's much more renewable energy and green focus than, than Trump and, and envisages seeding uh, a platform for US success in leadership uh, going, going, going forward in, in the kind of 21st century economy rather than a 19th slash 20, 20, 20th century economy rooted in, in oil. Good, thanks. Um, I, I just see a couple of questions coming in as we're talking. Um, and just a reminder, if you do want to um, send us a question, um, it seems to be mostly coming through on the chat, or you can also do so on the, on the Q&A. As I said at the beginning, uh, we're going to treat the questions as anonymous as far as, as who sent them, so that you're free to ask the difficult questions that you feel you want to ask. Um, as, that, as that sort of as those filter in, um, I'm just going to stay with you for a while in terms of the, the economics and now really trying to focus um, more specifically on, on Africa. Um, you know, can you just give us a sense in terms of um, the relevance um, of, of the election outcome on, on Africa's economic growth? Um, obviously, recognizing the countries are, are at different stages. Um, and, and give us a sense of where you think um, the growth industries lie. Um, and then 
I guess just adding to that, what, one of the questions that has come through is, is around, which I'm sure you would touch on in any event, is, is around the sort of financial distress that Africa finds itself in generally, particularly as a, as a result of, of lockdown. Um, so if you have remarks around, you know, potential bailouts of, of African countries um, within the context of that, we can, we can treat those as, as, as sort of separate questions, but, but they, they, they may sort of um, go together. Sorry, that's quite a mouthful of a question, but hopefully that makes okay. sense. Sure, no problem. Um, so uh, Africa's GDP uh, or, or economic kind of uh, mix is highly correlated to developments in a handful of countries. So we're looking, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, 47 countries, uh, but seven countries compose 72%, nearly three quarters of, of, uh, of, of GDP. Oil-based economies such as Angola and Nigeria are likely to face uh, a tough go of it, regardless of, of who wins uh, the election on November 3rd, whether or not, as, as Millard uh, so eloquently <laughs> outlined, whether or not we know it on the evening of November 3rd, but whoever it will be, and I'm confident that we will have a winner and, and, and eventually a, a concession, um, those countries are going to face uh, a, a, a tough, a, a tough few yards going going forward because of the shift within and beyond the United States to more energy and fit, uh, efficient and, and climate friendly uh, practices. Globally, uh, we're likely to see the economic impact of, of COVID-19 lingering for at least the next two years. Um, my colleagues in the Economist Intelligence Unit don't believe uh, that our base case forecast is that GDP will return to 2019 levels until sometime in 2022, thus the two lost years. Some countries will have um, a longer number of years to retrace GDP um, steps, if you will, than others. Unfortunately, South Africa being one of them. So we're not expecting GDP to return to 2019 levels in, in South Africa until the fourth quarter of um, 2024. Uh, it, it's not uh, all gloom and doom, however. Um, the, the level of anxiety that we're seeing means that uh, capital is flowing to what's deemed to be safe haven assets. You know, on one side of the equation, that could be U.S. Treasuries, um, but but on the other side, it could also be things like gold. So large gold producers um, stand stand to benefit. South Africa would be in that mix. Ghana would be there. Burkina Faso, Sudan, um, and Mali, to to name to name a few. Uh, the shift to renewable tech and things like electronic or electric vehicles could see the demand for things like copper and cobalt, cobalt rise. There, there, there's approximately 10 kilograms of, of cobalt in each uh, electric vehicle that, that, uh, that's rolling down or will be rolling down uh, a, road, a road near you. And I think it's also important to understand that there's some macro things outside of the U.S. elections that have been happening and will continue to happen. So COVID-19, for example, has effectively delivered the third um, body blow, if you will, to globalization. The first one came with the global financial crisis. The next one, uh, perhaps a left hook to the liver, came with the US-China trade spat and had corporations thinking about their supply chains and decoupling them and the risk that exists because of, of tariffs and, and so on um, and so forth. But COVID-19 has really had companies and indeed countries thinking about uh, where uh, they source uh, 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 and produce uh, key, key supplies, whether it's PPEs or medicines uh, or, or other products that, that, they may, that they may need or may need to supply to, to customers. So this could lead to uh, investment and value chains in the region. And I think also important is, is, is to be remembered that uh, we're in uh, the largest free trading zone in the world. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement has been ratified. Uh, it's been delayed because of border closures linked to lockdowns uh, uh, associated with the pandemic. But there's a clear intent on the part of policymakers for government leaders and so on for, uh, for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement to go live in, in the new year, which um, 
is, is more positive than anything else to, to, uh, to driving investment, to building and reinforcing uh, value chains and ecosystems, uh, which would be investment positive um, in general and in specific countries well placed to take advantage of it uh, in the region in particular. Can I just to interrogate part of what you said there, Herman, if I may, um, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, mm. uh, practical implementation, is that something that you see as a, as a long rollout? Um, you know, how difficult is, is it going to be to, to, to get that implemented from a practical perspective? Sure, and uh, I missed uh, part of the, uh, one of the earlier questions. Maybe let me deal with the earlier question, and I'll come back to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So, uh, one of the big issues that um, that we're dealing with uh, globally, not just in the African context, is this dramatic rise of debt, trillions of dollars being added to government balance sheets, and raising the possibility of sovereign defaults. So let's take the example of Italy. It's the third largest sovereign debt market in the world. Uh, it wasn't doing too well before COVID and the situation has now uh, become more, more concerning. Um, GDP, debt to GDP has increased uh, dramatically. Now on, on the other side of that equation, we have the EU coming to the party with, with a, a pretty uh, robust funding package with concessional loans and grants and so on. So it, it kind of uh, lowers the, 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 the temperature of concern to an extent, but there is a possibility of sovereign defaults in a number of countries uh, around the world and some that may have systemic sort of financial contagion related risks. Closer to home, uh, we've had a trend of debt to GDP rising for some time. And the, the kind of, I think it's important with, with debt to GDP figures and debt generally to, to peel back the layers um, because a high debt to GDP number may not be the, the only indicator of risk. An example of that would be Nigeria. Nigeria, if you look pre-COVID uh, 2019, debt to GDP around 25% what's the big deal? But if you start peeling back the layers, you'd understand that around 50% of fiscal revenues in, in Nigeria were going to service debt. Uh, if you look at another ratio, kind of you know, uh, export earnings relative to debt payments, then there are three countries where the lights are flashing in, in, in worrying hues in our region. And those would be our neighbor to the west of Namibia, uh, north of them, Angola and Zambia, which is currently trying to uh, trying to renegotiate its its uh, its debt debt arrangements with the range with the range of creditors, and they're and they're going backwards and forwards about what what uh, what type of haircut they're they're going to have to going to have to take. So so debt concerns are 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 real, uh, and and in particular in our region, and of course uh, in the South African context, uh, the fastest um, growing uh, contributor to to the to the budget has been interest servicing. So so it is a very real issue. With regard to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, it's pregnant with possibility. We have to see uh, in what. Uh, <laughs> What, what shape and form the birth actually takes place. Um, most uh, uh, pundits and, and observers believe that it will be growth enhancing. So we could see in the, in the, the medium term, so over the next three to five years, um, GDP increased by uh, per, per annum growth, increased by 50% 50, 50 or more. So if the growth was going to average two, you'd end up with a three 3% 3 growth. Uh, but the devil is in the detail. Um, and it's not just about um, what tariffs come down, but, but what infrastructure is in place to really grease the wheels of trade, moving people, moving capital, moving goods, moving services. So I'm more optimistic about it than not, um, but we still have some ways to travel to see if the promise will be realized. Thanks, Herman. Um, John, coming to you, if I may, um, you know, we're talking about investment in Africa, um, you know, and I think Herman has really set the scene for us in, in, the, in the sense of, you know, potential areas where businesses might, might be interested in investing. Um, 
in, I would say in the last five to 10 years, we have, but particularly in the last five years, seen a significant uptick in interest in Africa from, from US companies. Um, and I just would like your thoughts um, within the context of, of what we've been talking about, the elections in general, but also some of the specifics that, that Herman has talked about. Um, what do you think sets the right um, environment for US companies to be looking abroad um, for potential expansion into Africa? Um, you know, and I'm, I guess I'm talking here about what, you know, what do you think is the impact of what's happening domestically as well as um, as well as as policy considerations as well. Thanks, Charles. Uh, uh, Herman does uh, help set the stage. I'm a little bit of a quandary because my last question on uh, on corporate behavior was going to raise the question of U.S. debt and how that gets played out under Trump or uh, Biden. But let me stand back for a moment and ask uh, and answer the. The, the earlier question that you posed to me on, on what models have been more robust under US policy and are likely to continue now and try to get to that last point about uh, uh, Africa and the environment for, for US uh, corporate investments. But I'd like to at least remind everyone that on Saturday we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and the liberal international order that was defined by the three pillars of the Security Council and the General Assembly in the political sphere to prevent another war, the economic development institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions, and the Human Rights Declaration uh, have evolved awful lot in the last 75 years. And we really have had a speedy transformation of the international system from 51 states to 193 sovereign states. And sovereign states really still comprise our international system and we wish there were a higher authority that would facilitate things like the, um, uh, the African trade agreement, but unless sovereign states can reach some consensus, presumably by democratic, not forceful means, uh, that is to say negotiate, uh, we're stuck. So since the 1980s, we have seen a different model slightly from the liberal international order that uh, was, was conjured up in the aftermath of World War II and that's been described as neoliberalism that everyone seems to have bought into at that stage um, where the private sector uh, tended to be unshackled and in a highly competitive profit maximizing way. Um, Trump's model, if it can be called that, is much more transactional and nationalistic, but were he to get elected, I suspect that his advisors would still continue to be the traditional Republicans who have argued for lower taxes on corporates uh, on, and high individuals, less regulation and less oversight or transparency. Now he and his family have set standards for secrecy and use law not as a framework for principled action, but as a, a, a way of getting away with things, another tool to advance their personal economic interests. The secrecy that also predominates many international financial institutions, the quest for tax havens, exploitation of mispricing and, 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 and higher prop with high profits would um, in some cases be money laundering and those would all continue under, under, under Trump. I meant to say international financial transactions, not international financial institutions. Um, a Biden presidency raises more interesting questions for me about his economic plan, which suggests a somewhat different model, and in fact, maybe more akin to the earlier liberal internationalism with more governmental regulations, greater transparency, certainly regarding taxable income, and with a more activist Green New Deal for government to play a role. He spent 36 years, I remind everyone, as a senator from Delaware, which was America's first safe haven, tax haven, where, where state jurisprudence favors companies uh, and friendly arbitration. But Biden is also pro-labor, pro-union, and ironically, his model is more akin to making America great again than is, I would say, uh, uh, Donald Trump's. Um, and we've already talked about revitalizing multilateralism. I think the new bill before that the Congress, that the, that the House of Representatives passed, H.R. 2513, Corporate Transparency Act uh, of 2019 
uh, would set a new standard for transparency and beneficial in, in beneficial ownership uh, of, of companies. Uh, America, as you know, has been very, very lax in this regard, but the Senate is, is, is trying to water it down, but is also interested in passing it. I haven't read the whole 101 pages, but assume some of you have, and you certainly know better than I the state of the debate about regulatory requirements pertaining to beneficial ownership and tax benefit disclosures in South Africa than I do. Um, but my guess is Biden would likely support early, early passage of the beneficial ownership law, especially if the Democrats gain control of the Senate. And this is another topic of mutual interest that could be discussed between Ramaphosa and Biden in an early uh, conversation that have been advocated by Biden's uh, African advisors, as I understand it. The bottom line is if Biden wins, as seems certain, and even if Senate stays Republican, it would be advisable and advantageous for companies, now this is me speaking, to pay closer attention to cutting deals that are open and above board for all partners to benefit in a more transparent and accountable way. Thanks, John. Um, any comments on that from the other panelists before I before I get, carry on? I, I want, want to um, read one of the questions. Um, a great question that has come through. Uh, Milad, I'll, I'll pick on you because you're my colleague um, to have a bash and, and then maybe the other panelists um, want to, want to um, offer their views on this question, if I may. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I know you can handle it. Um, so the question goes like this. It's an unusually dangerous time for the reasons outlined by the panelists. The conflation of a pandemic, an exceptionally deep economic crisis combining supply, demand, and financial shocks, widespread social disruption, distressingly coarsen political discourse and contestation between the US and China on trade, technology, and national security in a period of debilitated global institutions and a greatly weakened normative framework puts the world at risk of sleepwalking into disaster. What institutions, and here's the question, what institutions do you see as stemming the, stemming the slide and enabling something close to a coordinated recovery? So I think the question really is about which institutions are, do you think are important in, in, um, in recovery? Um. Charles, that's a great question. Um, and let me begin by stating something that should be fairly obvious, um, but it relates to the question that's being asked. First and foremost, I think, and I'm going to assume for the sake of answering this question, that the winner of the election in, um, in two weeks time will be Joe Biden, and that we'll be looking at a Biden presidency. And what that I think is going to mean is that he is going to have to repair the damage that has been done by the Trump administration. And that is going to mean that many of the institutions in the United States are going to have to be rebuilt, uh, restructured uh, and, and um, provided with the kind of leadership necessary to be able to address the question that's been raised. Take the State Department. The State Department has been virtually destroyed by Pompeo and those who have supported the way in which the administration has worked uh, against the multilateral interest of the United States. So I would think that when you look at institutions globally, um, the United States is going to have to repair its relationship with its allies across the board, but particularly in Europe where we have had long standing relationships, NATO, um, Europe, we're going to have to look at those institutions at least initially, repair that damage, and then look at way in which we might begin to utilize uh, the, the vehicles that are available to us. I, I think the point that, um, that Herman has made uh, about perhaps one of the uh, concerns that uh, this pandemic has done is that it has put another nail into the coffin uh, of globalism. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I do think that what is likely is greater cooperation uh, is going to be possible under a Biden administration, a willingness to work more closely with our allies and more importantly than not, finding ways in which the United States can be a part of a much greater team addressing some of the concerns and questions that are raised by the kind of um, sleepwalking into disaster that has been raised. Um, I'm sure perhaps either Herman or, or John have a, a much better view on this, but I, I think if you look at uh, a Biden administration and assuming, uh, and I'll take, I'll take the liberties of saying that the Democrats win the Senate as well, um, with full control of both the legislative and, ex and executive branches, it will have two years in which to implement an approach toward stabilizing the global environment and reestablishing the role that the United States can play in that environment. And two years is not an awfully long time. Um, and my sense would be that they will cherry pick very carefully the areas in which they are going to make a difference. Um, and some of that will be, I think, more importantly with establishing, re-establishing a better and closer relationship with our allies. Thanks for that. John, anything you want to add from the perspective of, of institutions? Sorry, you're on mute, John. The phrase for the year, yeah. No, I, 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 don't, I don't think so, uh, uh, Charles. I, I just think that um, when Millard talks about uh, the backlash that could occur uh, and deny uh, Biden uh, control of all branches of government if he wins big on November 4th, he will do everything possible to avoid a repeat of Obama's problems that occurred in 2010. And so while in the short term there will be caution, in the longer term it may serve the purposes of of, of reform and finally having America grow up as a democracy. But I, I will return to the other questions uh, be, before we run out of time. Okay. Um, thanks. So what, there's been a couple of questions and, and also we've talked a little bit about um, the U US China trade wars. Herman, if I can come to you, um, I, I think, you know, there's a couple of things here. The one is, and some of this we've talked about a little bit um, in the sense of, you know, different approach to, to China. And, and John gave us some initial views on that. Um, one of the questions that's come in as well is, is, is this in some way potentially good for Africa? Um, so if you can just give us a little bit more, um, more context on, on, on that. Sure, and let me um, maybe elaborate as well on a on a point that um, that Millard that Millard made. I, I don't think that globalization is dead in the water, but I, I I do think that some of the more recent developments over the last decade, and I outline those as body blows, um, have certainly put some speed bumps in the way of globalization. Linked to that is all of this debt, if you will, um, that has been thrown at dealing with the demand and supply side shocks to try to protect lives and livelihoods. Um, there were people in the United States not long ago, some of them unfortunately having their benefits run out, but they were receiving more in unemployment benefits than they could working a 40 hour week job. Um, Six hundred dollars a week, which which is, uh, I think, uh, pretty damning. But it but it is it is what it is. But eventually, that bill will need to be paid. And because so much money has been thrown at trying, for example, to save businesses um, and to protect industries, it leads to more of an inclination towards protectionism than you might not otherwise have, right? Uh, I also made the point that there's an area of agreement, uh, seeing eye to eye, or perhaps objective, the objectives are aligned, the means would differ on having to confront China. And many of the voters that Biden will want to persuade to tick the box for himself and Harris 
have seen their middle class aspirations dissipate away because the manufacturing job is no longer there. It's, it's across the border at best in Mexico and at worst, perhaps um, uh, over, over, over uh, an ocean or two in China. And most Americans have a negative attitude towards China and China does not in and of itself encapsulate globalization, but it's part and parcel of that mix. Bringing it closer to home, if you think about how much money, <laughs> this may not be the best example, but how much money has been thrown into state-owned enterprises like ESCOM, it's almost you're so far down the road that you kind of have to see this trip through. Um, very difficult in some instances to change direction. Um, and again, that is uh, a, a speed bump, not an insurmountable hurdle to globalization. I think globalization will is is and always will be with us, but the nature of it uh, is likely is likely to change. To your question specifically about all these dynamics at play and how does Africa uh, stand to benefit? Well, it depends. I, I, I spoke uh, earlier in my comments about, well, you know, there's, there's a flight to safe, ha safe haven assets. So if you're a gold producer and you have the right kind of regulatory and other framework in place, uh, maybe now is the time to, to, make, to make hay. Um, if you're uh, South Africa, which um, has, you know, significant inflows of FDI from all over the world, um, China is a major, major trading partner. You're literally kind of in the middle between East and West. Um, you have a lot more options, if you will, available to you than if you're Zambia or if you're Angola or if you're um, Eritrea, which is heavily indebted to China. And, the, 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 and China will call the tune. Um, uh, so I think where we find ourselves, and this may be a little bit off topic, is that countries and companies increasingly will have to uh, make a choice. Uh, am I going to more favor China or the West? And particularly encapsulated in, in, the, in the US context, but it very much depends on, on the nature of, of the dynamics in a jurisdiction as opposed to Africa as a whole. Um, having said that, China is the single largest bilateral trading partner with this region. The EU as a collection of countries is the largest, but on a bilateral basis, um, it is China. And I suppose uh, one last thing before I conclude is China will be um, the only large economy that grows this year. It will not experience the two lost years. Yes, growth will be nowhere near what I'm sure uh, she would have wanted um, at this time last year, probably five, six percent. They were comfortably thinking they could they could tick off tick off the list. It'll it'll be under it'll be under two percent. But they're they're seeing that v that v recovery because of some of the draconian uh, well draconian may not be the right word but some of the actions that they took in really trying to get ahead of this novel coronavirus and life is coming back to normal that's more positive for Africa than it otherwise would be because of that trading and finance and investment uh, relationship things in other parts of the world and in particular the EU are going to be a lot gloomier for for the foreseeable future. Good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Herman. Um, certainly keeping an eye on, on, on China and, and the way in which they've responded and, and seems to seem to have recovered in a way that is, 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 you know, better than other parts of the world. And certainly from, from our perspective where we see sources of potential foreign direct investment, um, you know, we have seen a trend that the countries that are, are further down the path towards some sort of new normality are, are earlier in, in looking abroad or potentially looking for opportunities as compared to those that, that are still really deep in, in the midst of the challenges domestically. Um, so I think that, that stacks up certainly with what we, we're seeing from a, from a deal flow perspective. Um, so I'm just conscious of time. Um, and I think what I want to do, I think we, we have, we've mostly gone through most of, of the questions. I, I just want to give each of, of the panelists an opportunity to see if there's anything you think I've missed. John, I'm going to start with you because I, I think you made a comment about uh, US debt and, and, and the impact on that for, for US corporations potentially looking abroad. I just want to check with you first whether you think we've dealt with that or 
or whether you have any other closing remarks before before we bring things to a close and then Millard, I'll come to you and then Herman after that. Thank, thanks, Charles. Um, I won't belabor the um, enormous uh, spending and the low interest rates that the Federal Reserve has uh, given America as a, as a heads up, but that someone's gonna have to pay that bill eventually. It will be large and it will condition uh, the policies of a Biden administration. But I guess I wanted to say one further word about globalization because it is so essential for, for Africa. Maybe we gotta stretch our minds a bit to think about political globalization rather than economic globalization because the kinds of problems that loom for us as a human community are climate change, pandemics, immigration, as well as trying to uh, prevent local conflicts for which we don't have the institutions or the political resolve that are inside states but increasingly, the African Union reminds us we cannot be indifferent about each other's internal affairs. So that maybe the crises of the pandemic and the crisis of climate change may force uh, the hands of political leaders and may require the kind of social trust that we haven't seen so far to motivate um, a, a collective uh, approach to things on a functional basis that will run ahead of the institutional uh, uh, structures that we've inherited from World War II, namely the United Nations system. I say that because I think it is a very creative period and that Africa, unlike China, China is a civilization nation. It's, it's 90% it's percent Han. It's not like uh, uh, the diversity of, of the oldest population in the world, Africa. And the African in, ingenuity in trying to find ways of collective action may be more of a harbinger of the future necessities and imperatives than China is despite its discipline and control. Uh, so let's think creatively at this moment and I think I should pass then on to Mollard and to others. Thanks John and thank, thanks for bringing it back to, to Africa at the end. Um, uh, that's appreciated. Um, Mollard, any, any comments in particular? Do you, do you agree with John's comments about us being at a, an inflection point, um, particularly from an African perspective as, as we close. Um, thank you again, Charles. Yes, I do agree with John. And I also like very much the idea of thinking about political globalization as opposed to perhaps economic ones. What I'd like to do is, in my closing, I think, is turn my attention back to the impact of a Biden administration on Africa and to point out uh, a couple of things which I think are important to appreciate um, as that administration, which I hope will be um, the victors on whatever date it is, January 6th, December 14th, uh, November 3rd. But whatever date it is, I anticipate a Biden administration winning. And what will it do when it looks to Africa? Well, the first thing I think is uh, what I mentioned earlier, there is going to be enormous pressure on Biden to rethink uh, the American economy and to try and deal with the issues that are, uh, both the pandemic and the economic uh, downturn that the, con the, the country is facing. So in that context, Africa will not play a major role. Um, and if I I hate to actually admit this, but I do recall from when I was in government, um, one of the notions that was often made about Africa and those who handled African policy was to keep it under the surface, not to have it in any kind of way uh, disrupt the real issues that the, 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 um, the department was facing or that the United States was facing. With that said, and the other thing that I've noted in my experience with how administrations have dealt with Africa is that they all like to establish some kind of a flagship program or project that serves as the basis of what they've done on Africa. I owe my, uh, I owe my appointment as US Minister Counselor to Africa. I was the very first one that was ever appointed to the continent of Africa by the US Department of Commerce. And that was done as a part of an initiative by the, uh, the Clinton administration to effectively say, we are paying attention to Africa. We will put in place 
a, a minister counselor with ambassadorial rank to demonstrate our, the importance we see. Um, it was followed by AGOA. Uh, we've looked at Power Africa. We look at Prosper Africa. So each administration comes up with a flagship project that will hopefully um, catal serve as a catalyst for the approach toward the continent. I would suggest in that context, it might be good to look at the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and do as perhaps it was done in my case, appoint a, a senior official to that body uh, to represent America's interests and to coordinate with that body the development and growth of the African, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. But in short, and I'm mindful of time as well, in short, I think we need to be aware that however much and however important Africa is to us here, it is of less importance to an administration struggling with the kinds of legacy issues that the Trump administration will leave the Biden administration. And I will end by saying, if it is a Trump re-election, you already know what you're gonna get. And it's those, I can't pronounce the word countries, that's what you're gonna be looking for. <laughs> Thanks, Milad. Uh, Herman, you've got the last word. Wow. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks again uh, for, uh, for providing the platform and, and for doing uh, such an excellent job moderating, Charles. Um, I think I would just, uh, I agree with, with, uh, with, with John's comments and Millard's. Um, what I would probably underscore is that the environment in the United States is deeply polarized. Uh, according to that Pew poll that I highlighted earlier, Americans, three quarters of them are viewing this election as a battle for the soul of the nation. And there is a very real risk um, of, social, of social unrest. Um, I suppose what gives me some hope is what we're seeing now in terms of the tens of millions of people who have cast ballots already. And it's ushering in what is likely to be the highest participation of the US electorate in over 112 years. So the last time it will probably be this high would have been in 1908. Having said that, uh, because a significant percentage of people are voting early and a significant percentage of those are voting by mail, we shouldn't expect to have a result on November 3rd as I have become accustomed to in my adult life uh, the kind of evening Eastern, Eastern Standard Time or late, late evening knowing who's won, that's not likely to unfold uh, on November 3rd uh, Eastern Time, November 4th, our time uh, in, in 10 or so days, days time. The polls may be wrong, I suspect, I suspect not, but ultimately I think Biden will win and he's going to face um, a significant challenge for all the reasons that we've that we've articulated: rebuilding relationships with with allies, the economic crisis, the the health crisis, the social discord, and unlike um, Trump, he I think will be the president of all Americans. Not if you happen to be from a red state or if you happen to be a Republican, um, he'll be the president of of all Americans. But in some ways. He'll face uh, a, a tougher, a tougher challenge, and maybe to John's point, he can look uh, look to Africa for for, for lessons uh, lessons about how you harness and manage that diversity rather than viewing it as a threat. Um, but I think generally his approach, multilateral, bringing people together, will be good for the country and will be good for the international order and will serve, notwithstanding buildup of debts and, and protectionist tendencies, which are building up, uh, what will serve um, to provide a better platform for trade and investment, which, which should filter into the African context. Although I agree with Millar that Africa probably won't be front and center of the regions um, uh, taking, taking up a significant amount of, uh, of attention of the Biden administration. And lastly, I would just make the point that really important not to overlook what happens uh, in Congress and in particular the Senate. The House of Representatives should stay in democratic hands um, just based on how districts are composed. They're, they're, they're a bit more predictable, uh, but in order for 
a Biden administration to push their agenda effectively, they need to turn, assuming he wins, they need to turn three seats. Uh, and odds are that that will happen. If he doesn't win, um, then the Senate will still be of, of importance to Trump uh, to maintain control. Um, and, uh, and that's looking to push his agenda through and perhaps to save himself from a, a second impeachment trial. Um, that's in the realm of speculation, but it's looking pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, on, on the side of Democrats winning in a number of battleground uh, states at the senatorial level. That would be Maine, um, Montana, Colorado, Arizona, Georgia is in play, even South Carolina is in play. Um, and the Republicans have more to lose than, than to win because out of the, the third or so seats of the Senate that are, um, that are up on November 3rd, um, about two thirds of those seats are being defended by Republicans. Uh, that, that's where I'll, I'll, I'll end it. Thanks very much. Um, it leaves only for me to thank you, John, Herman, our own Millard. Thanks so much for your time. We, we really appreciate it. Um, I certainly have found it really interesting engaging with you and, and listening to you today. And um, I think that you've given us even more food for thought as, as we lead up to these elections. And, and it's been so useful to have your input. So thanks again. Thanks to our participants. And uh, that's it for today.